In the context of Bhagavad Gita, when we when we hear the term transcendental or trans transcending, basically what we're looking at is a distinction between we can see in our everyday life we have experiences that are coming through us through our senses. Our ears, eyes, nose, tongue, touch. So we're perceiving things in the material world. But those senses are coming through a material body, which we are now entrapped in, basically. Uh, or some people say we're enjoying our material body. Uh, as, we, as we go on in, in transcendental self-realization, we come to understand that truly the material body is more of a hindrance than a help. But we'll get to that later. But basically, in answer to your question, when we refer to transcendental, we refer to that plane of our existence, which we all have, which is above the, the perception of our material senses, hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting. Uh, the nice thing about Krishna consciousness, as Lord Krishna presents it in Bhagavad Gita, is we don't... You know, when most people talk about a discipline of yoga or a discipline of Buddhism or any discipline of self-realization, there's a secession, basically a stopping, a controlling of the senses on the material plane entirely. You know, basically when they say they're going into samadhi, you basically, you cut off all the external senses. And you meditate on yourself within, your spiritual being. So that's, that's transcendental. Krishna consciousness has a different approach. We realize that both the spiritual world and the material world, our spirit inside our body and these material bodies and everything around it, all of it is the energy of the Supreme. So what we want to do is we can utilize our material senses on the material plane to experience our spiritual being. Just like we begin this class with chanting. Now, we could be singing any song, but we're singing the names of God. And that's a transcendental sound vibration as opposed to, you know, uh, I can't get no satisfaction. Okay, a different vibration, the same thing as using, we're singing, but one singing is on the material platform, and another singing is using our transcendental senses. Okay? We're spiritualizing our material senses by engaging them in a spiritual activity. So that's what transcendental means in, in context of Bhagavad Gita. So the coming along with God. Hmm? The coming along with God. Okay. I mean, not like you, know, like you are God, but I'm saying. Yes, connecting right. Connected, right. Right, correct. 100% correct. So, we did kind of go over the first nine verses, and we're going to quickly go over the next nine, and we'll pick one of them and uh, chant it this evening. I'm sorry, seven. And uh, so we'll start on page 38. And I'm just going to read through the English translation of the verses and then we'll go back and we will chant one and discuss it. Okay. Text number eight. There are personalities like you, Bhishma, Karna, Kripa, Asvatama, Vikarna, and the son of Somadatta called Burisrava, who are always victorious in battle. There are many other heroes who are prepared to lay down their lives for my sake. All of them are well equipped with different kinds of weapons and all are experienced in military science. Our strength is immeasurable and we are perfectly protected by Grandfather Bhishma, whereas the strength of the Pandas, carefully protected by Bhima, is limited. All of you must now give full support to Grandfather Bhishma as you stand at your respective strategic points of entrance into the phalanx of the army. Then Bhishma, the great valiant grandsire of the Kuru dynasty, the grandfather of the fighters, blew his conch shell very loudly, marking a sound like the roar of a lion, giving Duryodhana joy. After that, the conch shells 
drums, bugles, trumpets, horns were all suddenly sounded, and the combined sound was tumultuous. On the other side, both Lord Krishna and Arjuna, stationed on a great chariot drawn by white horses, sounded their transcendental conch shells. So, mm, let's, let's go to text number 14 for this evening, and it'll kind of give a perspective. So we are going to chant uh, the translation of the Sanskrit. All the squiggly little lines at the top, that's the Sanskrit language. Okay. The most ancient language on the available to us. And then we have what's called the uh, transliteration. So again, we're going to read the transliteration word by word for word, and then we'll chant the sloka. Tata, Tata, Sui Tai, Hayai, Yukte, Mahati, Sanjani, Stitao, Madhava, Pandava, Cha, Eva, Divyao, Sankau, Pradadam Tu, Tata Sweta, Hayar Yukte, Tata Sweta, Hayar Yukte, Tata Sweta, Hayar Yukte, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Divyao Sankau Padadyam Tu, Tata Sweta Hayar Yukte, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Divyal Sankal Padad <coughs> Padad Matu, Divyal Sankal Padad Matu, Tata Swetar Hayar Yukti, Tata Swetar Hayar Yukti, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Divyao Sankal Padamatu, Divyao Sankal Padamatu, Tata Svetar Hayar Yukti, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Madhava Pandavas Chaiva, Divyao Sankau Padadmatu, Divyao Sankau Padadmatu. Tata Svetar Hayar Yukte, Tata Svetar Hayar Yukte, Mahati Sandane Stitao, Mahati Sandate Stitao, Madhava Pandavashtaiva, Madhava Pandavashtaiva, Divya Shankal Pradad Matu, 
Divya Sankha Pradadmatu. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Tatasvetarhayayukte. Mahati Chandane Shitao. Mahati Chandane Shitao. Madhava Pandavas Chaiva. Madhava Pandavas Chaiva. Divao Sankhao Padatmatu. Divao Sankhao Padatmatu. Tata. 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 Thereafter. Thereafter. Swetar. Swetar. With white. With white. With white. Hayai. 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 Horses. 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 Yukte. 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 Being yoked. Being yoked. Mahati. Mahati. In a great. In a great. Sandane. Sandane. Chariot. Stitao situated. situated. Madhava, Madhava. Krishna. Krishna. Krishna, the husband of the goddess of fortune. Pandava, Arjuna, Arjuna. The, son of Pandu. the son of Pandu. Cha, Cha. also. also. Eva. Eva, certainly. certainly. Divyao, Divyao. Transcendental. Transcendental. Sankhao, Conch shells. Padadmatu, Padadmatu. Sounded. Sounded. On the other side, you can chant repeated uh, responsibly. On the other side, On the other side both, Lord both Lord Krishna and Arjuna stationed on a great chariot, on a great chariot drawn, by drawn by white horses sounded their transcendental conch shells. Poor Port by A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. In contrast with the conch shells blown by Bhishma Dev, the conch shells in the hands of Krishna and Arjuna are described as transcendental. The sounding of the transcendental conch shells indicated that there was no hope of victory for the other side because Krishna was on the side of the Pandavas. Jayastu Pandu Putranam Yesam Pakse Janardana. Victory is always with persons like the sons of Pandu because Lord Krishna is associated with them. And whenever and wherever the Lord is present, the goddess of fortune is also there because the goddess of fortune <clears throat> never leaves, never lives alone without her husband. Therefore, victory and fortune were awaiting Arjuna as indicated by the transcendental sound produced by the conch shell of Vishnu or Lord Krishna. Besides that, the chariot on which both the friends were seated had been donated by Agni, the fire guard, to Arjuna. And this indicated that this chariot was capable of conquering all sides wherever it was drawn over the three worlds. <coughs> on the other side, both Lord Krishna and Arjuna, stationed on a great chariot drawn by white horses, sounded their transcendental conch shells. Mumajana Trimananda Sya, Janajana Salakaya, Chakshun Militanyena Tasma, Shi Gurave Namaha. I was born in the darkness of ignorance, but my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. I offer my respectful obeisances unto him. So, this distinction in this verse, we just quickly reviewed the seven verses, and we noticed that. The scene is being set and the description is being given of the tumultuous sound before the battle. Now, that doesn't happen in today's battles. But in olden times, and even back, you know, Civil War and before that, before there was a battle, there would be a great tumultuous 
uproar of sound by the two parties, by the two combatants. Uh, I specifically remember, uh, you know, like the even the movie Braveheart, the, the you know, the soldiers would just scream and yell. And, uh, you know, there used to be bugles blown before a battle. So, similarly, the Battle of Kurukshetra, before that, there's a tumultuous sound from both sides. Basically, people were pounding their chests. We're the best. We're going to become victorious. We're going to be victorious in the fight. You should run in fear and not even fight us because we're so good. So, that's sad. That question you had, transcendental. Here we see in this verse, a distinction is made between the sound of the Kauravas on the one side and the sound of the Pandus. The sound given by the conch shells on the Pandu side is, has that special quality. It's transcendental. The purpose of that sound, first of all, it's transcendental before because Lord Krishna himself has taken the side of the Pandus. The Supreme Lord himself has taken that side in the battle. Why? That's basically what I want to touch on here this evening. Is, first of all, we know that the Supreme Lord is not truly partial. He's situated in everyone's heart. He's situated everywhere. His energy pervades everything within this material <coughs> universe. And... How could God be God if there was partiality? He has to be equally disposed to everyone because everyone is his offspring. So for, for to be on a battlefield and on one side you have God on your side and on the other side God's not on, the so on that side, the common man would say, why? What, what's that about? Why is God picking sides? God has now said, I'm on Arjuna's side, I'm on the side of the Pandavas, and I'm not on their side. Well, actually, before the battle, they had their choice. The other side had their choice. You can either, either, either have, what was the choice? You could either, all, all the right, you could either have all of my armies, or you can have me. That was the proposition that Lord Krishna gave to the opposing party. Which do you want? Do you want to have me or do you want to have all this material arm, you know, armament? And they said, we'll take the, we'll take the armies. And thousands and thousands of soldiers. So, and of course, the Pandavas being naturally Krishna's devotees, they wanted just Krishna. Because they knew wherever the Supreme Lord was, all victory is there. All opulence is there. All knowledge all beauty, all renunciation. So, here at the beginning of the battle, the two sides are drawn up to fight and Krishna is on the one side, but he's not going to actually engage in the fighting. He's simply going to be a chariot driver. He's made a promise. I won't fight. That's pretty, that's pretty nice of him because if God wanted to get into it, who would survive? <laughs> Unfortunately, at this time, historically speaking, people didn't recognize Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead. Mm. So they didn't know that they didn't know what. First of all, to take Krishna on their side, they didn't know to do that because he was actually God. Because we are so conditioned by this material world. We get so wrapped up in enjoyment on the material platform, we would even we would have a very difficult time recognizing God if he was to even come amongst us. Even you have a great personality like Jesus. In Jesus' time, how many people recognized Lord Jesus? Or Buddha's time? Or Muhammad's time? All these great manifestations of the Supreme Lord have come to give us instruction, but when they come, how many people in society actually recognize them? Very few. So similarly, even when Krishna came in his original form, again, the Lord, he's unlimited, he has unlimited forms. And all those forms 
He explains in Bhagavad Gita, Yada Yada Hi Dharma Sya Glarnir Bhavati Bharata. Wherever and whenever there's a decline of religious practice, at that time I descend myself or I send a representative to set things right, to get people back on track. Because this material world <coughs> is truly a place where we can rectify ourselves and return to our eternal, transcendental, spiritual nature. And that nature is free of all the inebriates that we experience here. Particularly birth, death, old age, disease. And three principal sources of misery. Misery from our own self. Our mind gets out of control. We can't, you know, we don't know what. We get an anxiety. We get depressed, you know. Uh, so those miseries we actually inflict upon ourselves. Miseries that are inflicted by other people. You know, you're driving home and somebody pulls in front of you. Or worse, they walk up to you in the street with a gun and say, give me everything you have. Or worse, they start a start, you know, a family feud and they kill people in your family. And worse, I mean, it gets worse and worse. It can get very bad from other living entities. Or mosquitoes. Even a mosquito can cost so much. A snake. So those are miseries from other living entities that we, we experience. And it's going to be icy tomorrow. Nobody wants the ice storm. Nobody wants the snow, and nobody likes the cold the way it is right now. A little warmer would be okay. But those are miseries that come from higher authority, from higher power. Because somebody's controlling the weather, and we don't really have a say in the matter. When the hurricane is coming, there's nothing any military force or any country can do to stop the hurricane. It's coming automatically. So... A lot of people, they'll look at the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita and they'll actually look to spiritual life and they'll say and say, is, is all this, all you guys got is this negativity? Everything in the material plane is bad? You know, well, yeah. It, when you know what the spiritual plane is, when you know what your true spiritual nature is, when you know how to enjoy Satchitananda, eternity, knowledge and bliss of your true spiritual self, yeah, everything on the material plane is more or less <coughs> miserable. So it's not that we're negative in the sense <coughs> that everything in the material platform is bad. Everything's bad because we misuse it. We can have a fire, and with the fire we can cook, cook food and enjoy a good meal. Or we can go with a fire and burn down the city. Now, which fire do you want? The fire that's burning down your house or the fire that's in your stove to cook a good meal? Both are fire. So everything in the material world is based on how we use it. Either we use it to a bad end or to a good end. So that brings me to the topic of tonight's discussion. Why is there a battle in which the Supreme Lord has come and basically if we read preliminary to Bhagavad Gita and Mahabharata and the history of what came, what brings us to this stage of a battle, what actually is the situation that God would come down here and try to rectify things? That he would actually engage the Pandavas, one half of the family, against the Kauravas, the other half of the family, to determine who's going to rule. So... I wanted to touch upon, because it, it's the perspective that's given in Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavad Gita is preliminary study. This is our preliminary study of spiritual uh, knowledge. And as we progress in pursuing self-realization intellectually by listening to these transcendental literatures, we'll come to the platform of studying more and more of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is... Uh, Postgraduate study, let's say. So, when I was thinking about trying to convey in a class what actually is the situation in society 
because we don't really have an experience of what is proper rulership on this planet. Even if we look at, our, at, the, at the history of the last thousand years and we look back to all the rulers and all the kingdoms and all the countries and all the different forms of government that are there, we don't really have an example of truly what is a society based on what is called Varnashram Dharma, on a proper division of the society of mankind for the spiritual upliftment peace and prosperity of everyone. So, I want to give a little bit of, of perspective on that. Um, and this is a perspective from what is called Raja Dharma. Dharma is the engagement all of us have our dharma, our engagement in life. Raja dharma is that engagement of the proper managers, the leaders of society. Raja dharma is a great science, unlike modern diplomacy for political supremacy. The kings were trained systematically to become munificent and not merely tax collectors. They were trained to perform different sacrifices only for the prosperity of the subjects, to lead the prajas, that's us, as opposed to the rajas who re lead us, <clears throat> to lead the prajas to attainment of salvation was a great duty of the king. The father, the spiritual master, and the king are not to become irresponsible in the matter of leading their subjects to the path of ultimate liberation from birth, death, disease, and old age. When these preliminary, I'm sorry, when these primary duties are properly discharged, there is no need of government of the people by the people. In modern days, the people in general occupy the administration by the strength of manipulated votes. But they are never trained in the primary duties of the king, and that is also not possible for everyone. Just that one sentence in this one Srimad Bhagavad, just imagine this, that this purport by Bhaktivedanta Swami was written in the early 60s when he was still in India, before he ever embarked to the U.S. and started the movement of Christian <coughs> consciousness in the Western world. And so interesting, when these primary duties are properly discharged, there is no need of government of the people by the people. In modern days, the people in general occupy the administration by strength of manipulated votes. <laughs> now, this was written in the 60s. Yeah. On the other hand, these untrained administrators gradually become rogues and thieves and increase the taxation to finance a top-heavy administration that is useless for all purposes. Again, just think of the administration. We, we, we watch the news, we look at the, you know, the Congress, we look at all these politicians. Every once in a while they'll catch one. Most of them get away with it because they write the, their laws themselves. But once in a while, though, they can't even follow their own law, laws for exploiting the population simply to take money for their own, you know, luxurious lifestyle. While the citizenry in the country, what, is, what happens? There's no sufficient health care. There's no f sufficient education. You know, there's no... We could go on and on about what plagues our current society. But, I mean, just when we look at the fact that we pour billions of dollars out of this, just this one country, what to speak of the, the whole world together, that, you know, all these administrations, all these intelligent, so-called responsible leaders throughout the world, they can't even wipe out poverty. They can't go into a place on the planet that's completely impoverished and in an uproar where people are simply one one side is slaughtering the other side. Innocent women and children are being 
starved to death. And the leaders of the world can't even come together to solve a problem like that. They're so wrapped up in personal greed and self-aggrandizement. Now, this is basically the circumstance that has brought Krishna to the battlefield of Kurukshetra. On one side, he wants to install proper leadership, and on the other side, you have a side that is not truly interested in the self-interest of the citizens. A typical king is the ideal of the people in general. And if the king is pious, religious, chivalrous, and munificent, the citizens generally follow him. Such a king is not a lazy, sensuous person living at the cost of the subjects, but alert always to kill thieves and dicoits. The pious kings were not merciful to dicoits and thieves in the name of nonsensical ahimsa. Everyone's familiar with that term? Ahimsa, nonviolence. Buddha specifically, his manifestation is ahimsa. So, you'd think, well, every religious person has to be, has to imbibe that quality, ahimsa, nonviolence. But there's a, there's a time for violence. There's a time when the leaders have to stand up and do the right thing. They have to push aside the thieves and the dicoits. You know, those people that come and disrupt families that rape women and children. A proper leader, you can't just say, well, please don't do that. Well, a thief's got to say, yeah, right. And pull out his gun and shoot you. So proper leadership is there needed in society. How would, how would you, what would you recommend to solve a situation like that? What would be proper leadership? If, I, if you consider yourself non-violent, mm -hmm. but you want to es establish certain rules, how would you do that? Well, you'll find as you study Bhagavad Gita, the perfect, perfect solution is given. And what is, what is Varnashram Dharma? The proper institution of divisions of mankind and divisions of your life. There are four divisions of mankind. And basically we can see this in every society. There's the saintly people that are simply religious by nature. They're good-hearted and they just want to pursue spiritual values. And that class is referred to as the Brahmin class, the Brahmins. Then we notice the administrators, the worldly leaders, the kings, the presidents, the people that run, the heads of state. Okay, and they are called, they are the Kshatriya class. And... They basically keep the citizens in line. Then we have the Vaishas. The Vaishas are the mercantile class. Most of us fall into that class. We work for a living, you know, and we, we have, uh, you know, we, we either grow agriculturally or we engage in, engage in some trade. At least that's what Archie and I are Vaishas, I guess you'd say. We have a business. We support ourselves. And we give in charity. To the, to the Brahmins. And then you have Sudra class. Sudra class is basically servants. They serve all the classes. You'll notice in every society there's a class of men who <coughs> simply like to do service. And it's not that they're lower or higher, but that's just their natural proclivity. You know, they're not intellectuals, they're not merchant, merchants, and they're certainly not spiritual. So, those are the four divisions of society according to quality. Quality of what? What they do? Right. Their function? Yes. Okay. Their dharma. Basically mm -hmm. what they, you know, what, what, what attracts them in life. Then we have divisions of our life where we, know, knowing the purpose of Human life in particular, as opposed to the other living entities in bodies that are less than human, animals, plants, they also have souls, you know. Uh, I mean, there's no question, if you were just playing with my dog for 20 minutes, you know that the, the guy's there. Okay, but he doesn't have intellectual ability yet. 
So, we have divisions of our life. We have our student life. That's called brahmachari. Uh, we have our married life where we go and we get married. We bear children. Uh, later in life, there should be a time, and unfortunately in this society, we're not. this isn't even there, so people have no concept of it. There should be a time to retire. In this society, people generally work all the way to the fag end of life. You know. But generally... There's, at midlife, you should begin to, to give up all the entanglements of material life and take to your spiritual consciousness. And ultimately, you should renounce. You even should walk away from household affairs. Your children should be old and, and taken care of, especially for the man, should be taking care of uh, your wife because they're grown and they're making income. And you should, be, you should renounce. And you should dedicate 100% at the end of your life, simply to spiritual pursuit, because death is your death's doorstep. And when death comes, the wife, the children, the bank balance, the house, the position in society, it's all going to be ripped away no matter how well and how nicely we've situated ourselves in this world. It's all going to be gone, ripped away. So your question is, how can the ahimsa do the worldly administration to keep out thieves, dicoids, whatever, you know. Uh, that's the position of the Kshatriyas. The spiritual leaders, the Brahmanas, they're naturally going to be nonviolent. And you'll notice in a proper society, especially as presented in Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the essence of all Vedic teachings, that Seldom would the Brahmins, the priestly order of mankind, seldom would they, they ever engage in any violent activity. Except when, they were, when their hand was forced and the king was, they, they had to do something because the king was out of control. And the Brahmins, being priestly and being spiritually uh, situated, uh, their violence wouldn't be like, you know, the violence of a war. They had enough spiritual <clears throat> energy and spiritual shakti and, a, and enough mystic power that they could simply do away with the king without what we would consider violence, although he would be gone. So any death is violence, I'm sure. Uh, you know, if it's untimely, it's a violent death. So basically the administrators would always adhere to the Brahminical class as far as taking spiritual direction. So the administrators, the kings, politicians, rulers of society, worked under the good guidance of the Brahmins. So they would keep things in order, following their direction on a spiritual basis. But how is it for someone like me, I don't want to consider myself any kind of class. How, what can I be then? Do I have well, to let's, become let's, part of it? No, mm. this is this Krishna consciousness. And, and right now, we ba let's just become, let's try to become spiritual in our life and see things. What is material? What is spiritual? What is right? What is wrong? You know, uh, as far as instituting Varnashram Dhamma in the current society, in the current age of mankind, which we'll get into the different ages of mankind, this is unfortunately the most fallen age. So instituting Varnashram Dharma at this point in time is probably not ever going to happen. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Well, there's a natural course of things. Just as there's different seasons, there's certain cycles. Of there's also a cycle of mankind through different seasons of man. We're, we're in the winter, and there'll be a spring, but before it comes, mankind will continue to decline. Except, there is a nice, nice thing about this particular age of man. And despite all of the, all the, wickedness and violence and uh, quarrel and hypocrisy of the age of Kali, which is what we are in, we can make super spiritual advancement 
just by this little kirtan, just by chanting the names of the Lord, those names have such spiritual potency that they can bring us to the transcendental platform immediately. And we can purify ourselves without going through all the rigors that required in past ages of severe austerities and penances, yoga practice, meditation for thousands of years. You know, to make spiritual advancement in other ages was a real, you had to make a real effort. Things are so fallen in this age, it's like, it's not a blank check, but it sure, it sure is pretty close to it. If we could take a true interest in transcendental knowledge, in our self-realization, and employ some simple principles in our life, we could advance amazingly in this, in this very lifetime, in this age. Even though we're only going to be in this body, what, at the most 100 years? Not a very long time. In other ages of mankind, you were in one body 1,000 years, 10,000, 100,000 years in one body. So much time to perfect your existence. In this age, we have hardly any time to even get started in true purification and uh, self-realization. But... So it could be an excuse that we are not so far then. Well, there's no real excuses in the material world. We got here by our own circumstance. We didn't come here, although we didn't have a choice of whether, what body, whether a man, female, this country, that. We had no choice of, of what body we were going to take. That in and of itself shows how fallen our nature is. Because generally in prior ages, you were so perfectly situated in mystic control you decided when you're going to leave your body and where your next body would be. So do you think because of mankind over the centuries or thousands of years question God so much that we cannot see the beauty of, its, of his creation anymore so that we somehow bring this misery upon ourselves because we don't, we don't live or we have a hard time being one with the power of God. Although You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You think that... that I mean, I'm just make, you know, fooling around. I mean, I can imagine that if you think about what happened over, you know, if you look at a normal history book, you mm-hmm. can see how how our society, our Western society right now, lacks incredible amount of spiritual right. guidance next to everything else, too, and that we feel so lost and confused and, and kind of with, you know, that we've lost the purpose of why we're here. I mean, that makes that's basically Kali Yuga. Yeah. That's this age of mankind. Everybody, it's called the age of coral and hypocrisy, and it's take it's it's the last, the fag end of 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 humanity. There's no humanity. Now the battle of Kurukshetra, the the scene is happening at the end of the prior age. Okay, prior to this age, which is Kali Yuga, there's Dwarpa Yuga. Dwarpa Yuga, mankind lives for a thousand years in one body and practically everything's everybody's righteous you know uh, but as time progresses uh, you know also these natural cycles these seasons of mankind naturally progress and this is the most fallen age so I don't know if that answers your question but it somehow it does I mean, we, we are here of our own, we are here due to our own, the karmic forces of our own prior lives. Nothing happens by chance. We are here, You're guided. You are, we are guided by higher authority. So then for some reason I must have chosen that lot too to make up for the crap I did in the most before. You chose it, but you didn't make the direct no, choice. I know. No, I know. Somebody had to make the choice for you. All right? Higher authority made that choice. Okay, you acted like this in your prior life. This is the result of that. So Bhagavad Gita explains that. At the end of life, wherever our consciousness, wherever our consciousness is basically centered on, at the time of leaving this body, kind of sets, 
sets the scene for the next body. Okay, I've done so much good, I've done so much bad, I really like these particular things, I dislike these things. You know, all I like, like you could see, there's certain people in society, all they want to do is eat. They go from restaurant to restaurant, all they do, eat, eat, eat. Other people, all they want to do is have sex. Okay, this girl to that girl to this girl. Or, you know, all other people, all I want is money. Oh, let me work. Let me have this business. Let me start another business. Let me buy this business. Let me buy that building. I can certainly outdo Donald Trump or Billy Gates. Did you really want to? Some people do. See, they're drawn by that desire. And that desire, whatever our main desires, some of them, Beethoven, Bach, what did they want to do? They wanted to create great music. So much so that in their prior lives, they had developed such a desire that even when they were born, they were hardly children. They were already making, writing, concerts. I have one question. I'm sorry. You, I'm it's all right. I, no. I have one question. If I have this desire, but I'm a conscious human being, I always have the choice. Mm -hmm. Right? So if I look at Donald Trump, I see a very sad man who got so scared that he could lose what he has, that, mm -hmm. you know, that he thought he had to do it more. But if I have to, so if I understand my desire and the negative path a desire can lead to, so I can positively affect my my life now. If I come to the you know my common senses and realize that I have the choice. Right. Okay. Just Why not do that? No, I did, I try to do that. Good. Well, then you're better than Donald Trump. Yeah, I feel very. But sorry. if you talk to Donald Trump, if you were to sit down in Donald Trump's office, believe me. And he told you what he was about. He is such a powerful man, a powerful businessman. Well, go sit in his office. He didn't get where he is just by chance. No, I know. Right. He I, has I his Shakti him, too. I, I would ask him why he's so afraid to have no money. Yeah, he, he'd he probably would give you a, a, a reasonable, from his viewpoint, he would give you a reasonable. He would probably just say, why are you afraid to have money? Very good. Mm -hmm. There you go. And then he'd probably hire you so he could have shot your heart. <laughs> <laughs> but you have people they are born without a desire. Mm -hmm. Especially they don't know. They don't know, yes. Because you have some people they know, I'm going to study this and they're going to become what they study. Mm -hmm. Others they don't know. Other, right, and they kind of just wander around. So that we have our free will. Our free will is always there. At any time, you can say, I am going to be a virtuoso, you know, guitarist. And I'm going to sit in my room until I've mastered this instrument and I'm the best on the planet. And no one can pick a guitar as well as I can. And if you go and you apply yourself to that, even you may not finish it. That's what Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita. Wherever your mind is at the end of this body, even if you haven't attained that material thing you wanted... Your next body will, you'll set the stage for your next life. And it's wherever your mind is at the end of the body? Yes. So that's why we want to, like, we want to occupy ourselves with good things because we don't know when the end's coming. You None of us know. The door down here get, Done. Finish. Get run over Poof. the street. And if, you know, I've got good things on my mind at the end, that'll affect where I go next time. Right. So, right? But basically, what we'll learn from Bhagavad Gita is Krishna says from the highest planet to the lowest planet. We're on a middle planet. This is earth. You know, there's, there's the mode. We're also going to learn about the modes of material nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. This is the planet earth. We're in the middle of the passionate planet. Why? What's, this, what's the ocean here? You have a choice. On this planet, you always have a choice. No, but what, uh, we're talking about the modes of nature. We're in the mode of passion. Goodness, passion, and ignorance are the three modes of material nature. On this planet, we have oceans, and the oceans are what? Sweat. Salt water. There are planets within this material universe that have oceans of nectar, oceans of milk, oceans of ghee. And there's planets where the oceans are liquor. Just imagine, you don't even need to go to the brothel. You can just go to the ocean Drink away. That's mode of ignorance. Because people that live in the brothel, where, where's their brain? They can't even, they don't even, where am I? What am I doing here? What day is it? 
Where's my house? Can you take me home? We get so enwrapped in the mode of ignorance, we don't know. We don't even know where we live. I used to be very upset with these people, but lately I have a little bit more compassion with them because I somehow realized that if they choose to be like this for now, I can't change it for some reason. I guess I don't know what, what how Krishna approaches like what you do with people like that, or what, how, if you just you know, have to accept it for what it is. I guess that's the only way. Learn different. We'll we'll learn as we study again Bhagavad Gita. Krishna will give us direction how 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 we deal with everyone, how we make those determinations. There is pro, there's a proper way to deal with everything, and there's a proper transcendental, self-realized way to do with every deal with everything, and that is the essence of of Bhagavad Gita, and that's why we're here is to learn what how to how to live in this world, how to enjoy this world to the fullest in a transcendental way. Any other questions? I about the desire Okay, uh, one thing I, I, I want to make a, uh, a clarification here because I've heard this. What do I think? All right, I, I have over the course of the last couple decades come to understand that what I think is truly not that significant. So that's why we take knowledge from higher authority. So anything that I'm going to try to relay when, when you have an inquiry, I'm going to try to relay what the proper response is based on what is considered guru, sadhu, and sastra. So I may veer aside from now and then and give you my opinion, but as much as possible, as we purify our existence, as we situate ourselves spiritually, our thinking really isn't that important because... We're imperfect. First of all, our senses are imperfect. And because our senses are imperfect, I'm certain to make mistakes. I'm certain to be illusioned. And as much as I can, if I can get away with it, I'm going to cheat. So those are four propensities we have just in this material body. We have imperfect senses. We're certain to be illusioned. We're going to make mistakes. Uh, has anybody here not made a mistake? Uh, I like to like mistakes because I learn a lot. I made one. You made one. That's good. Well, even Archie made one once. I, I thought I did. I was okay. <laughs> and and we cheat. So so again, your question. I'll try to answer. I just wanted to kind of make that point is I'm going to try to always give a perspective based on on what I've learned from my spiritual master on what's presented in religious in scripture guru, sadhu and sastra and what everybody else everyone else that has pursued self-realization and transcendental wisdom what their conclusions have been so those three things together basically are the way that we should learn to see the world And once we learn to see the world not the way I feel, not the way I think, not the way my senses tell me things are, but how descending, coming from the transcendental realm, people that are actually have made it, that are self-realized, would see things. So now I've diverse and I forgot your question. Desire. (coughs) Desire is Normal, but we're naturally going to have desires. Well, I think she's saying if you don't have them, right? Or if you don't have them. Everyone has desire. Have, yeah. Even the desire not to have desire is a desire. 